Okay, welcome back all to our data science learning community and our book club in Advanced R. We are headed into the module about object-oriented programming, which is quite complex when you're doing this in the R programming language. What the textbook author has in store for us today is kind of a interlude and aside where we talk about the base types of R, which I found out in itself is complex as well. So for our learning objectives on the screen, you can see that we want to understand what object-oriented programming means, at least for R, and to know how to discern an object's nature and type, whether that's in base R or in the object-oriented programming. As the textbook author noted, when we talk about objects, we're kind of just thinking about this in the way that John Chambers said, where John Chambers was the creator of S and stayed on as part of the creation of R. He said, everything that exists in R is an object. So that just kind of gives us our motivations. Like, well, if everything we've been doing is an object, we probably should know more about them. So why is object-oriented programming hard in R? Well, first off, you'll notice quickly, if you read the table of contents, that multiple object-oriented programming systems exist. S3, R6, S4, and maybe in the near future, S7. A quick shout out to our host, John, for uh, fixing my typos. I still had that as R7 up there. Is definitely S7 amongst the developers. Second bullet point, there are multiple preferences. Some users prefer one system, others another. Makes sense. And R's object-oriented programming systems are different enough that even if you're coming into this with prior object-oriented programming experience, it might not transfer well. We'll still talk about some of the ideas, but the folks who are delivering the next few chapters will definitely help us see all the subtle differences. Now, whenever you talk about these materials, such as Hadley Wickham's uh, All Studio Conf talk a couple years back, people quickly go back to this XKCD comic. This is particularly apropos because when you look at seminars like that, R7, now S7, S7 is supposed to unify some of these ideas for the object-oriented programming systems, but there's a concern that S7 will just simply be yet another uh, system to learn. Do we know, is, is S still under a development? <laughs> like, is it like, cause they, they I, I read, you know, that it says that their, the S numbers, they're rel they're, they're, they're marking which versions of S these came out in. And so if they're calling it S7 instead of R7, that suggests S is still under development, which I didn't know if that was the case. Uh, like, is it like the, um, is it the previous, like, so S3 is called that because it used method dispatch that was implemented as uh, S version three, but like maybe like we are currently in S version eight, but it's maybe not anymore like maintained since then. You know, <laughs> I don't know. This is a good question. We should check that out. I will. I will just write it into chat to remember it. <laughs> yes, uh, it is an interesting point in the textbook itself. I did not put this on the slides. When it came to these notion of base types, the folks that were working with S did a revision to add a base type in 2005 and then another one in 2011. So in other words, at least for the base types, there has not been an addition in 13 years. I also have a question. Do do we know if other uh, languages have multiple 
object oriented programming systems because like i don't know if there are like many in in python and in javascript just like they're just objects and, and and that's it like objects and classes i i didn't know that uh well i i don't know if they have like many systems like r uh, like i think J java is well known to be like the object oriented <laughs> it's nearly built only around that so uh, if you are like a java developer you probably mostly do op i think But yes, I agree with Diana. Yeah, so but... When you're a Python programmer, you're pretty much taught only one way to do it. Yeah, are you multiple way of doing it? Yes, yeah, like the multiple systems. Because, well, like, I, I guess we're, we're going to find out the way, because I, I honestly, I, I don't know what are the, the differences between S3 and, and R6. I guess we're going to find out in the next, uh, in the next weeks. I mean, but yes. Like, I, for example, if we take S3, I do not think S3 has inherent ends. Okay. So we just made a dispatch. So uh, like for some people, it will not count as object oriented programming. So this is like, you know, like you have multiple scheme of doing stuff. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I think the seven just came because we are on R6. And so like, this is a new way of implementing object oriented into R that's more related to S than instead of um, the, yeah, I don't know. This is a good question. I will, I will try to find in S7 package if they provide answers, but yeah, go for it. <laughs> good. Yeah, so some people are not always saying that S7 is S3 plus S4, but more in a concatenation sense. Oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, go for it. So when we talk about object-oriented programming, uh, I'm not sure if uh, folks in the audience have seen a, a lot of the object-oriented programming before, but just to at least review some of the concepts, the couple of the big ideas include polymorphism and encapsulation. Admittedly, I'm just going to read off the slide. So polymorphism is where a function has a single interface looking from the outside but on the inside contains several class-specific implementations. So skimming through this, if we have some function, if the argument is numeric, you might carry out some something thereof. But if the argument is a character-based, you might do something else. So one of the earliest examples of polymorphism that you encounter in a introductory R classes, say if we do the summary command, we use the ubiquitous empty cars data frame, and you notice that we get the numerical summaries of some of these columns. However, if we make a linear model, we could also, in the syntax, apply the summary function and definitely get quite a different result thereof. As uh, uh, folks pointed out in a recent keynote in USAR 2024, uh, part of this is that if you actually go into the code for summary or the manual pages, you'll see the, the breakdown of how it starts to branch off to handle these different types of inputs. So at least in my opinion, uh, polymorphism is pretty common across programming languages for what they want to achieve with object-oriented, uh, towards what they want to achieve with object-oriented programming. Conceptually, what was due to me was this encapsulation. Encloses an involved capsule, both data and how it acts on data. For example, think of a REST API. A client interacts with an API only through a discrete set of endpoints, things to get or set. But the server does not otherwise give access to its internal workings or state. Like with an API, this creates separation of concerns. Object-oriented programming 
functions take input and yield results, users only consume those results. So what we're going to see in the upcoming slides is that's part of why some folks wanted one version of, I'll just start calling it OOP, one version of OOP versus another version of OOP as uh, what they wanted with this encapsulation. Continuing to review some terminology about OOP, objects have class. So a class defines methods, what can be done with an object, and fields, data that defines an instance of the class. And objects are an instance of a class. As an aside, I fully admit, as on a teacher point of view, I really should have had an example here, but I didn't want to um, cover the same materials that next week's speaker is going to do. That's why I skipped it. If this is your first time talking about object-oriented programming, I assure you it will become more clear next week. Another property that various languages want with object-oriented programming is that a class is inherited. First, a class is defined by its object class or perhaps by the parent of an object's class. One example you see in R is that you could make an ordered factor, but that in itself is a subset of factor variables. Now, as uh, Olivia was talking about, what we as R programmers are concerned as we navigate through these different systems for object-oriented programming is the method dispatch. At first, you could think about this like a switch statement or a case when that sends you in different directions. Inheritance matters for message dispatch. If a message is defined for an object class, yeah, just use it. That is, if the class says what to do, just start with that. If, However, if an object does not have a method, use the method of the parent class. If that is, you want the inheritance to happen. And the process for finding a method is called dispatch. Now, this reminds me of some of what, what we've been talking about with variables and environment searching, that if a variable is not found in an environment, R might um, go up to the next uh, superset and search for the variable there which is a good feature for R sometimes, and some uh, folks dislike R for those reasons. Inheritance is kind of analogous to that. A verbal, let me just go over a quick example. When I first started learning object-oriented programming, the example is about mammals. Um, mammals, uh, for the most part, have hair. Uh, they, they, they breathe um, air. If you make a, a, a subclass like cat or dog, you could say the cat meows, the dog uh, barks, but they also inherit the, the mammal characteristics, have hair, breathe air, and so forth. And thank you for the wonderful comments in chat. Okay, so now let's see how this plays out in R. There are a couple of paradigms. You can have the encapsulated OOP. Objects encapsulate methods, what can be done, fields, data on which things are done. The calls communicate uh, this encapsulation of uh, since form follows function and the idea, I believe, is that we have function calls just like elsewhere in elementary R. 
a week for an object, we can apply a method with the arguments. Oh, I might have switched the wording there. For functional oop, methods belong to generic functions. From the outside, this is what looks like what we encounter elsewhere in early studies of R. You have your object, you, you follow it up with the arguments. And then we're careful that from the inside, components are also functions. This is why we spent the previous three weeks talking about functional programming. Now, before I get to the next really wordy slide, I took a moment to just make myself a concept map. And this is how it starts to branch off. The creators of R wanted some object-oriented programming. There were a couple of trains of thought. So with the encapsulated OOP, you have R6 and something perhaps less popular called RC. And then you have the functional OOP which is S3, which is what we're at the moment the most familiar with in S4. I, I assume we'll see examples of the encapsulated OOP when we talk about R6, but is there like, can somebody say, an ex like summary seems like a great example of functional OOP, right? Mm -hmm. Is there an example, a quick example that's really commonly used for, for encapsulated? I myself do not have an answer. Anybody else? Yeah, for it's for everybody. Yeah, yeah, I have like basically like when you use an RCS object, it will look like um, I I do not have like an example of RC stuff, but usually we define an object that has a, a very limited amount of method, and you call this method with dollar sign. So let's say like I'm define I'm calling an API, and the API has a certain numbers of uh, functionality. One of them usually will be get. So let's say like I'm working with. Um, my puppy API that so just return a, a, a bunch of photo of puppies. And um, uh, one of the implementation I have seen, you could have do that with functional oriented, like is usually like, like I, my object is gonna be my puppies. And then I will have a dollar sign get. That's exactly like when you, what kind of similar you do I feel in Python when you are chaining methods uh, inside. That's my understanding, but I never like used, I, I'm mostly used, I never implement an R6 uh, package, so I don't know R6 package, but this is all I, I will think about it. Uh, I will try to find an example while, while uh, Derek uh, go a bit. Yes, thank you. So um, when we talk about the advanced R textbook, uh, part of the reason why the author decided to make this its own chapters because a lot of the wordy nature that we're going to encounter in the next few slides, it was to kind of clean things up a bit. So admittedly, I'm just kind of going to talk quickly through all this anyways. I'm just going to program base R. S3, it was a functional OOP. It was R's first function, uh, OOP system. It's nice because it's a low cost solution for many situations that us more casual programmers, myself included, will probably encounter. But we'll probably see in the next chapter or so that there were complications that some of the developers uh, did not like, and thus they would want something more than that. So S4 came about, and I believe someone in the chat um, pointed out this was about 1998. It's a functional OOP. It's a rewrite of S3. And I wanted to also note, is this is the system that's used by Bioconductor, a huge ally in the R programming universe. So if you're doing genomics work and the like, you're going to encounter S4 programming at, at least for at least for um, basic analyses, at least for what they call basic. The quote is that there are more guarantees and greater encapsulation than S3, and we'll see that in about three weeks during that chapter. The issue, especially if you ever tried to use Bioconductor, 
is that there's a higher setup cost. There's there's a steeper learning curve there. Now, at some point, there was a notion called RCA. Um, we're just mentioning this um, in route to the next slide. It was an encapsulated OOP. It was a sp special type of S4 where an object is mutable. And we talked in previous chapters about the notion of modified in place versus our usual copy on modified behavior. And of course, uh, you as a programmer developer have to really understand that because sometimes your debugging adventures can be quite hairy and you have to dive in deep into what's really going on. So the folks that were primary for encapsulated OOP said that there were problems that were hard to tackle with functional OOP, that they found it difficult to implement in S3 or S4. And the downside, so these are harder to reason about, maybe more difficult to explain in, in programmer group meetings, and at times maybe even difficult to explain to your users, your clients. Oh, and these ones, S3, S4, RC, they come in base R. They they come when you install R. In packages, you could expand to the R6, which we'll see in a couple of weeks. This is the encapsulated OOP that several programmers wanted. And the idea is to resolve issues that in the previous RC. And in the perhaps near future, we'll have S7. I should fix this typo. This is S7. It is a functional OOP, but what the developers at Posit and, and elsewhere are aiming for is to, in their claims, grab the best parts of S3 and S4, that is the ease of S3, the power S4. And you could see more at the seminars that we mentioned earlier in the video. As the XKCD comic earlier kind of implied, there were many trains of thought when it came to object-oriented programming and how R should implement it. At some point, there was a root. I hope that was created by uh, folks in Australia. It was a hybrid of functional and encapsulated notions. And somewhere, I'm just stating my own ignorance, somewhere there was proto, a prototype object going to programming. But what's noteworthy is this is actually the style used in the ubiquitous ggplot package. So if you ever follow um, June Cho's work and how he basically took a semester off of uh, grad school to deeply understand GT plot, he probably really got into this. Are there any questions or discussion about these matters so far? No, I just... I just link it to an example of R6, I think, which is the Kaggle package that uses like to interact with Google API. I, I just wanted to say that functional OOP was one of the things that I found the like most <laughs> difficult to grasp about R when I when I first started programming in R because I was like, how can they allow dots on variables? Like if if you're gonna have to use dots for objects and method calculation, like, I was like, how, how how am I gonna do <laughs> object oriented? And then and and yeah, like the S four with with bioconductor, it's I I I, I honestly I, I don't like it because you have to pass the object every time 
to the function so that you can like make internal uh it has internal changes to the same object and uh, it still it still feels weird <laughs> that's a good point like we should have uh, that's not in the book like uh how the bioconductor works yeah yeah maybe yeah maybe 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 we should add uh a chapter about bioconductor but i'm i'm i guess we're gonna review that also in in s four but yeah like you have you have the 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 object and you can access some some parts uh, of well some 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 internal uh things of the of the object with the with the dollar sign or the the arrobas but you have to like if you want to make changes to that object using some other functions you have to pass the object as a first argument of, of that function so yeah that feels a bit weird i agree with these ideas at, at, at least for for me i definitely use underscores instead of dots in my variable names just in case i want to go back to python or whatnot yeah. <laughs> Uh, also part of Kelly Baldwin's uh, keynote talk at USAR 2024 uh, uh, pointed out that in her talk, uh, keep R weird. One of the reasons R does some of these things is so that we don't have to use quotation marks on variable names. I thought that was actually pretty nice. And as a teacher, I really like that. And same thing with column names as well at times. So now uh, we should note just some ac accessing notions that uh, analogous to what we encountered earlier in the textbook and might come in handy for later debugging. How can you tell if an object is a base type or part of the object-oriented programming? Some of the functions that we can use, there is an is object Boolean that could yield true false whether it is an object-oriented programming object. But as we've seen in earlier chapters, perhaps uh, developers wanted something a little more discerning. So they also developed the Snoop package, which has this O type uh, function, which will tell you if it's a, a base type, S3, and so forth. So for example, if we just have the one through 10 vector asking if it's an object in the oops sense, it's false. And if we run O type on it, we realize it's a base type. It's literally a vector. If you look a little more deeply at the empty cars package, motor trends cars package, this is reported to be an object oriented programming object because once you start to dive deep in it you realize it's of the s3 type which is kind of motivating or like well what is that and of course we'll discuss that next week now uh folks like me only heard the word snoop in one place so this sent me down a bit of a rabbit hole I was trying to uh, figure out why that was the name of this package because I only heard about it from the Beach Boys song. And fortunately, I asked a, a fellow programmer, someone who's not an old programmer, uh, our programmer, why is that the name? They pointed out to me the obvious. The package writer wanted this to have oop in there. <laughs> so it was a bit silly. And then once you go into the package documentation, it is indeed Snoop for S language object oriented program. So it's nice that that all worked out well for Hadley. Also, just continuing going down the rabbit hole, um, Snoop John B, the Beach Boys song, it turns out in itself is an adaptation to more classical folk music from the Bahamas. So it's good to know. Object-oriented objects have a class attribute. 
at least in this sense, if you try the attribute function on the base type vector, ask for its class, nothing's there at the moment. Verboid, this just sounds funny to me. A base object has no class. Whereas for what we'll be studying in upcoming weeks, object-oriented programming objects have one or more classes. Once again, the Motor Trends Cars data set was an S3 object. When you look up its class attribute, you get data frame. Um, perhaps more popularly these days amongst teachers and the like, when you look at the Palmer Penguins uh, data, and you run the attributes, you get the multiple classes, the data frame, the tibble, and so forth. For this slide, it's a long list of words. Um, if folks have questions, um, we'll have plenty of time, but I'm just gonna read through this pretty quickly. Once again, only object-oriented objects have a class attribute, but every object, whether it's a base type or object-oriented, has class. I probably did not think too deeply about that. We could try out our type of function on these various base types. The null type, the character vector, the long int integer type, the complex numbers. User-defined functions. We encounter our favorite word, closures. Uh, there are special functions, such as the array accessor, close bracket. And there are primitive functions that are built in that date back to the early days of R and S. We did spend time talking about environments, so that is a base type as well. And what we'll be moving towards in one direction is the S4 type that is, is available as a base type. In this example from the textbook, the stats for package does come included in your R installation. For example, for the statisticians, if you're seeking out maximum likelihood estimation, you could do these calculations this way. The returned object is of S4 type. And as we were discussing earlier, one of the popular examples these days is bioconductor and all they, that they do. Towards the end of the textbook, we'll go even deeper on the language components and learn more about what quotations do for symbols, languages, and maybe even something called paradise. And believe it or not, that's not all the base types. I think uh, Hadley Wickham mentioned there were 25 of them. And these are most of them. Rather than going through that list, I made a, a concept map to bring this all together in a, a Sankey graph. On the right-hand side, uh, following the same order that the textbook author used, uh, these are, this is the order that we have encountered the base types already through our studies of the index star textbook. So going down the right-hand side, we have the the vectors that was I believe back in chapter three. We have our functions. We have the environments. And we are here right now going into S3, R6, S4 in the coming weeks. And then the rest of the textbook will cover these base types here. 
as you mentioned in the chat, there are other base types that are meant for the truly deep diving developers that are wondering about C components and maybe memory allocation as well. Uh, but depending on how deep you go, I believe the textbook author said to not worry about that. Usually also like you will have a pro, uh, a package that help you doing that. I think for example, like uh, you have the package RCPP uh, for the people who want to interact with the, some C uh, API. As a build C to in your function or interact to the C API of R because R has a C API also where you can do like some stuff. And I think the Rust guy also in, use a package to interact also, but I don't remember the name of the package. I also find it interesting that dot, dot, dot is a base type. Oh my goodness. <laughs> this is the best type. Uh, maybe it's, it makes sense, no? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> yes, it has to get handled by someone. Someone. Yeah. <laughs> Are there other questions or discussion on this? I think I, there's only one more slide. A great example, a great uh, schema. <laughs> yes, thank you. So knowing these base types so uh, just kind of helps us organize our thoughts. The textbook and people in the previous cohorts wanted to warn about being careful about numeric types. So we'll spend a few minutes here. Oops, typo. One often numeric is treated synonymously as for doubles. Most of us just doing, myself included, just doing elementary calculations. Yeah, just treat the number as double floats, it'll, it'll usually work out. Every once in a while, you'll notice that at least when you're making, say, arrays and talk about the length of a, a vector or an array, you'll have the long int integer type. So in the first example, we could see that it's a double. The second example, we could see that it's an integer. Where this gets annoying, is that if you check the type after you apply as numeric, perhaps you're loading a data frame, you want to make sure you could do basic sample statistics on columns, you typecast this as numeric, and both of them now come up as double. So yeah, that could be annoying. Hmm. Yeah, because numeric is work for both, no integers and double. It's it tests for both of it, no? Mm -hmm. And so the most generic case is double. Yes. And we did t uh, talk about the typecasting and moving to, as you say, the more generic or more flexible uh, types in a previous chapter. Uh, there are typecasting functions such as as integer and such. You might see this carried over in S3 and S4. Numeric is taken as either integer or double. So when choosing methods, when we check if there is a S3, if this is an S3 class, or I'm not quite saying that right, it returns both double and numeric. So a bit more verbose. And we look at that long int integer uh, this S S session is both integer and numeric. This final example I did find pretty curious and I thought it was actually really clever. Is numeric test whether an object behaves like a number? Sorry, let me scroll down. So if you dig down into a factor variable, say, for example, if you're building a bar chart in ggplot and you will want to reorder your categories, you might, one way to do that is to make it a factor variable first so that you could set the levels. When you dive deep into what a factor variable is, you realize part of its um, storage is to have integers to help you rank the data, to help you set the order. So when you 
run type of on that factor variable, it will return the integers because that's how part of the internal representation is being done. However, when you ask, is this numeric on the factor variable, it will say false. It's a very careful concern because even though we do have integers describing the levels of the factor variable, you the programmer do not want to accidentally do more calculation with those numbers. For example, you do not want to take the average of the level numbers. But yeah, just some ideas to toss around as advanced R will consistently use numeric to mean either integer or double types. Even the textbook author will just go back and forth. And that, folks, is the end of the slide session. Uh, thank you for watching. And what else do we have to talk about? Yeah, I was just curious, like, is numeric on factor give false? Is it because, like, it's going to check the class and dispatch to another method on is numeric? Uh, do you want to share screen? Could you export it? I, I like, yeah, I can share. I mean, we can just discuss that. But my question, like, uh, is, like, is numeric is a generic method? And maybe when it targets a class of factors, in fact, you are calling is numeric factors that return the exact stuff. I don't know. Or is it inside of is numeric that's coded like why it's not numeric? I don't know. That's the S3 method dispatch that was always weird and you never know when you call it. But yeah. And yeah, I just noticed, I just went into read like the what's in behind like as numeric. And if you are writing um, inside of for S3 method, you should specify for as double. So uh, like I could definitely see myself like uh, making the mistake unless I read the doc uh, before. Just, <laughs> just, just read, yeah. Cause yeah, it, plenty of, um, and why does uh, is integer tip of, because you are asking what the type of is. Right, but the, but the type of like is is integer, right? Like you can see that in the example. Yeah, but it's, it's the integer is a character type. It's just integer. I think you are. Yeah, so uh, 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 that's uh, type uh, of re returns okay. the word, yeah. the character yeah, yeah. integer. A common trick. <laughs> it's the output, not the actual yeah. type. Yeah. Got it, yeah. got it, got it. I was trying to get the the type of, of dot dot dot, but I cannot make it work like that. That, <laughs> that returns an error. <laughs> uh if you backstick it. No. Okay. okay. Well, this is this is maybe for like next time. Well, thanks, Derek. It was very good, and uh, I'm glad we have done it. <laughs> um yeah, because yeah, how can it Type of maybe take ellipsis an argument, no, or not? I don't know. He can like, uh, I don't know. This is a good question. <laughs> we can add that for like the um, the the Slack. Yes. Okay. Does it have question or maybe it's a cautionary tale? Do not even dive into the C programming. <laughs> Caution to all ye that venture here. No, and then like all does the that that's I think this is at the language level you know uh ellipsis is uh, a language i i will I, I don't know i'm not a language designer but i will think of it as a language um uh token it's a token specific token from the language yeah. so yes but i don't know how it's defined <laughs> anyway uh thanks a lot um I, i'm gonna type end so we not forget it. It was very good, the the rec. Uh, I think a lot of it will be like learn into S3. I, I, I really like S3 because it's super easy to implement. So come next week. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye.